components of electrical motors and uh, what do we need to diagnose to start the motor. Uh, we talked about start capacitors. There are two other components we can use, which is uh, one of them is the potential relay. It's getting more, more popular, and you will see that most of the compressors. You don't see that a lot of fans. It used something called the back electromotor force produced by the starting winding. And this what controls our motor. So we have the startup winding and the primary winding. The, the startup winding produces a back electromotor force. Whenever you run current through it, it will produce uh, EMF electromotor forces. And based on the strength of that EMF, you can engage or disengage mm -hmm. your potential relay. Uh, this is what it looks like. Again, it comes in different shapes. Mm -hmm. It works with the startup winding. Acts as a generator to produce back electromotor forces. So when you will run this potential relay on the startup winding, and as the current keeps drawing, it will once it reaches a certain limit, it will click and it will disengage the, the motor winding and the startup winding. And uh, we said the more current we run through the wire, the more electrical motor forces we have. So it's, uh, it's properly timed to disengage at the right time. Uh, it's hoping when the motor reaches a certain back electrical motor force or a certain speed, usually 75%, 70 to 80 sometimes from the maximum motor speed. You want to run with the maximum motor speed. Uh, it's speed driven by, my, by the manufacturer, it should not change. Contacts are normally closed when the unit starts. So they are normally closed. Once the relay engage, it will open. So if we imagine, yes. if we were to imagine a simple way that we have contacts, this is our mechanical linkage. So as we run current through the, the coil over here, probably it will have more magnetic forces and it will attract this contact towards it and it will disengage the winding. And this probably will, will connect in parallel. So you run power through it until you reach certain electric motor force <coughs> until disengage the winding. So I want to make one If you were to be imaginative about it. What it looks like. This is so what would you check if you were to check this uh, relay? Check the winding, make sure it's uh, running. If you jiggle it a little bit, nothing should be inside rattling. Otherwise, mean, that means that the, the linkage here is broken. This uh, linkage is connected with a pin, or sometimes just connected with uh, the base. Very flexible, malleable metal that will rattle. So you don't want to rattle too much. Uh, two parts, either mechanical linkage or coil. Coil can be checked with an ohmmeter. Across to a pipe, uh, that's specific to that relay. But basically, you can look and see where the winding connects and check that with the ohmmeter. That should not be a zero. Contacts, uh, you can check the contacts because we said this is normally closed. So 
So if you check between them, it should not give you zero. It should give you a gradient. That's what it looks like. So this is going to be your compressor. It's going to start up winding. It's my relay, it's normally closed. And it goes, this one goes to a start capacitor. So when you want to check the relay, you got to check between two and five, and this should give you a reading. And if you check between one and two, it should give you a reading, so it's normally closed. <coughs> Question? <coughs> You have a question? Ah, don't too fast for me. Huh? Don't too fast, bro. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Let's slow down. Please. So we have a relay. You know what? What are the components of a relay? We got the coil, laser. The coil and linkage. If you were to test any relay, what would you test? The coil. The coil. You should get some reading. And you can check where the linkage make sure it's not loose. If you were to when you go and test the pin, it should give you a reading. Let's look at that. Just a <coughs> oh, so on the last slide, the foil and the contact, that was for the relay. Yeah. So if we look at any relay here, if you were to test this relay, just by looking at it, <coughs> we have, uh, let me put it in there. Yeah, at any time, if I go fast, if you want to do something, please stop me. You can look at this relay over here. This is my coil. So, you see the coil over here, and you see how it's connected those two pins in here? So, if I check those two pins with an ohmmeter, I should be getting something should be a reading. If this coil is burnt, I wouldn't get anything. And if I look between those two pins here, they are closed. So checking between those two will give me a reading. If you rattle it and something make noise, that means something is loose, something has been broken inside. And they purposely make this relay clear so you can look inside and visually inspect it. Uh, that's a relay. What about a contact? This is a contactor for an AC. I would say a contactor it has uh, how much amperage? Uh, 40? 20 plus. 20 plus. 20 plus. Yeah, more than 20 is a contactor. It's going to be a question in the final. Oh, Wait for what? Yeah. What is the difference between a relay and a contact? Yeah, I'll write it down. So this is a contactor, you'll check the coil over here, this is my coil, and this connection here should give me a reading between the coil. If I connect those two, I should get a connection between those two contacts in here. So that's a contactor, that's a relay. Okay? Solid state relays and devices. Uh, they're becoming more popular. 
The mechanical linkage gave us some trouble because again, the coil can sometimes wear out and there it takes a lot of manufacturing to make this, so which makes it expensive. So state are you to make to manufacture and they are based on chemical and resistance, resistance change. So when we say solid state, what does that mean? It's an electric board, right? Yeah. Huh? There's no moving parts. When you say that something is solid state, there is no moving parts. When you your hard drive and your computer, all the new computers are solid state. Nothing is spinning, nothing is moving. You agree? Yeah. The flash drive, that is solid state. There's no moving parts. You guys are aware of the floppy disk? Yeah, that organized yeah. yeah. It's spinning around. Probably younger people don't know about the floppy disk. How many floppy disks do you have? No. <laughs> we had a lot of floppy disks. <laughs> <laughs> CDs. CD? Is, is CD solid state? No. No, it spins. So a solid state is some, something that's completely solid and completely does not move. There is no mechanical parts. Uh, with no mechanical parts, there is less chances of failure. Or moving part, something that fell eventually, something was not, was not going to be contacting how that way to the, it's supposed to. So solid state time relate, drop out the starting winding, and starting capacitor on small chromatic compressor. <coughs> what do they look like? It's like a box, nothing rouse in it. Uh, you can't really test much of it, you just change the color to the state and hope it will work. It, usually composed of uh, material that will change your resistance based on the current, and uh, they're much cheaper than a contactor. A contactor is around sixty dollars. Probably can get a solid state around ten dollars. Uh, for permanent split capacitors, motors, they you really need that assistance to start. It. So you can use either potential relay along with the start capacitor. And again, uh, the PTC, permanent something capacitor. Is that like a lawnmower or something? Huh? A permanent split capacitor, is it like a lawnmower? Uh, no, it's like a small, small little motor like this, but it has a capacitor in it. It's just different configurations. You don't need to know all the types. I will highlight things that you need to remember in this chapter. But don't do much into the details. This is what the solid state re relay looks like. It's very small as you can see, and it does not open, and it clips on the capacitor from the outside. So either you see a capacitor mounted on the outside, or you see the solid state capacitor on the outside. And this will help the start winding engage or disengage. And why are they on the outside? So you can change them, because you cannot get inside the compressor, it's completely hermetic. And uh, how does it work? Some of them change resistance based on the current going inside and become high resistance once you run current to it. And at some point, it will stop the uh, start of winding from getting any power. This is another solid state relay with a capacitor. They are together. And you see the connection over here with the relay. And also, it will connect with the capacitor. When we get the motor from, oh, this one has, has one, let me show you. Look at this motor. Once you see a box on the outside, it means there's a capacitor. Uh, this part is going to be knocked out. Here's a screwdriver. You take it out, you find a capacitor with the solid state on top of it. And if you notice, the motor is very small because why? We have we don't have the start of winding, so it makes it smaller and easier to make and easier to maintain. And uh, if something goes wrong, probably it's the capacitor. Compared to this motor, that's pretty small, pretty in size compared to this one. And again, motors that, uh, are very involved. Fixing them is very uh, involved at the, in the shop. So it's better to have a motor that will stay there and keep things from the outside that you can change completely. Uh, if you look at a compressor, You'll see the start of winding in here, connected to the solid state relay. So, 
toes that relay is placed in series with the start body at the start of winding for fractional horsepower uh, pneumatic compressor. What does fractional horsepower mean? You guys got that? What is fractional horsepower? I'll write it down. So half a horsepower, one eighth, they're very, very small. If you look at this one, you see how much horsepower does it have? One over seven. One seven for horsepower. Mm -hmm. So it's not that strong. And the reason being is that the amount of amperage going through it is not that high. They have a uh, very low resistance. This is what's always that relay. So it's not going to give you zero, but you'll get some low resistance. As the compressor motor starts, current flows through the, through the start of winding. Resistance of solid state start winding relay rapidly rises and causes the current to increase. Current will flow faster. Temperature <coughs> raised. So it has to be linked relay. That's very interesting here. So solid state. Do you remember all the ACs that you have to turn on? And if you turn it off, it says, please wait three minutes before you turn the AC again. That is the reason that it's coming. So it says relay, and the three minutes allows the relay to reset. So you have to wait three minutes. If you do not wait three minutes, the power will go into the start of winding and go into the circuit switch. But, uh, there are new ones now that will do that. There's a timer, so even if you start it, you'll hear the fan going, but the compressor will not engage. You will have to wait three minutes. So that is the reason that some ACs you turn it on, and the compressor will not engage until three minutes because the start of winding has a timer in it. Once you disengage the power, it will start the timer after three minutes. It will start again. So, what would you find this kind of information? The manual, usually in the main plate, to say something about the three minute wait. Uh, this is another solid state relay. It's not out of plastic and it has, again, resistance change inside. So this is the current going through it. And this is the timer engaged. I don't want you to understand what's inside, but just to, for information, you know that there's a start of winding and there's a, a timer based here that will allow the give time for the relay to, to disengage or engage after you turn off the power. Uh, the reason being, uh, the reason being for the, the wait, what, what, what would you think is the reason for waiting? So it doesn't burn, no. Because uh, it's hot, you want to cool off by at least three minutes, which goes around two minutes, so three minutes in to make it, uh, make sure. And if you shut the power of the system with a lot of uh, amperage, probably it's going to overheat. So you want to give some time for the, uh, for the source uh, state to cool off a little bit. Usually, you've seen it. It looks, uh, hold on. It looks kind of plastic -y. If it overheats, what do you think will happen? No. It will melt, you'll see some kind of bulging. You'll see some part is uh, squishy or has been melted. So visual inspection can give you an indication if this thing is running or not. And they uh, they made black color on purpose so you can check it visually easier. But uh, they come in different colors again. But visual inspection will, will do the trick. It could be charred, really burned, or cracked. It means the star of the day is bad. Uh, you can check the with uh, the resistance of solid state, if it's bad, it's going to be really high. Let's, let's write these down. this 
say you said there were, used to be relays in computers. Is that why they'd say not to put magnets in your computers? Yeah, that's for the relays and also that's for the hard disk. The hard disk is magnetic and it writes the information by using zero and one using magnets. So it's a part of small um, metallic parts that will change. So probably if you put a magnet through it, you change the entire structure of the information. So the resistance has to be very high. That means it's bad. Bad relay. Or visual. Like expanded in size. I know. Let's put it to your size. Because it could be either way. It could be either get like smaller or bigger. Both say change your size. Irregular size, irregular shape. If it doesn't look like a cylinder, but uh, first it, you know, it's something. Color in it. And let's just repeat components of motors. We have the winding, start of winding, primary winding, capacitor, uh, solid state relay, or potential relay. The last part we want to talk about is bearings. Again, we can talk about bearings a lot. You do not change bearings, but you want to know that if the bearing is really fluid bad or not. Uh, anything that's rotating requires to have bearings. You have bearings in all your wheels in your car to smooth the friction out. Uh, there are bearings in your crankshaft in your car. Most taxes will have bearings. So basically, you have bearings wherever you want to reduce the friction. Where does the friction come from? The weight of the equipment sitting on its base. Uh, two types, ball bearings or sleeve bearings. We said last time that uh, ball bearings <coughs> basically have small little balls in them. Spherical shaped balls within the, in the cage. And uh, over time, usually it's sealed because they don't want any dust to come inside. Any dust will change the friction and might grind up the, the little balls inside and you want you want to be contained. Uh, if you if you lose the seal on the bearing, you start losing some of the ball, it will jump out of like some uh, particles inside. Also, if you look at your car axle and your axle lost, first it will lose the boot, right? The boot will get cracked. Once you lose the boot, it's only a few weeks before you lose your axle. The boot protects the, the axle from uh, particles coming inside, salt, sand, stones, pebbles, and also the oil will start to dry out. And if oil gets some water in it, what will happen? Yeah, but why? Why not? Oil and water. Oh, it will just compose. It will decompose. Because oil, there's always bacteria in it. And they will have your uh, bacteria thrive on water. If there's water, you'll promote the growth of bacteria, and the bacteria will start eating your oil, and it will lose this viscosity, its ability to lubricate. And that's why we need to use oil. Uh, so ball bearings are designed with inner and outer ring, outside and inside. Enclose the balls by use of a separator. Usually there's a separator ring to keep them in place. Uh, inner ring. Yeah in which the shaft is pressed. So in here, we do press the shaft. Uh, there's a specific tool that you use to put in the bearing in place. Probably if you go to your mechanic, he has a ball bearing to press. There are ways to also press bearings in. Usually it has to do with heating and cooling. 
in the heat middle they expand. So you put uh, your bearing in a, in a, a tree, you know, in the wall. Oh, uh, if you want to put a shaft in the middle. Well, yeah, you gotta, you want to open it. Yeah. You open the bearing. Yeah. yeah. So you'll probably do a lot of that as well, huh? <laughs> so what you do is, usually, I used to work in a mechanical shop. So you put the shaft in the freezer. We used to put all joints in freezers all the time. Uh, which one? Trust and ball joints. Well, yeah. We used to put those in freezers. And that's, the that change in size is very significant. You don't see it, but you can measure it. Yeah, 1,000 up. That's all. So you put it in the freezer, in the freezer that will shrink a little bit. You put the bearing in a warm oven, not too warm, because you don't want to close the gaskets. You only need 1,000 of an inch. And use a press that will fit on the glove. Little. Once yeah, once <laughs> once they they become in a uniform, uniform temperature, it will grip really hard, and it will have to go away. It will have to come apart. Lubrication. There are primitive lubricated uh, bearings where we fill this gaps here with oil or uh, grease, grease, and that will uh, keep the oil in there. And some of them are have uh, pack lubrication. This is simple, the pack. So the whole pack is lubricated completely all together. Uh, <coughs> some of them, you put some grease on it and just leave it in there. And uh, the stickiness or viscosity of the grease will keep the, the bearing lubricated. For example, your engine. Your engine does not have to completely full of oil, right? You fill only five quarts and it's stained in the metal. The splashing of the crankshaft, you get some, you get some, Huh? Foam. If you have too low. Too high. Too high, you have foam. If the crank starts slapping the bottom. You might the blow up some gaskets. So you want it to be the right level, do not overfill it. Yeah. It's better to underfill than overfill it. Okay. If you overfill it, you have a lot of pressure, it will start to come out of the engine. And the bottom, you have a little bit of oil that will keep splashing and getting dipped into it. If you did any lead, any, any use of metal, you always find that the, the oil is just get dipped and it sticks, the oil is very sticky, so it sticks to the metal and you get a little bit of it all the time. In some equipment, for example, uh, pumps, you use the water or whatever product you have to lubricate your bearings. So you have a strand, sometimes it's a wick, something like a candle wick. They put it on top of the, of the bearing from the bottom of the reservoir and it will bring some molecules of oil into the, into the bearing. Uh, for most motors you buy, okay, pay attention to that. Um, a lot of small motors, they have small reservoir, about three or four drops. And before you engage the motor, you have to lubricate it. Come with a big warning sign. Use a certain oil, uh, three drops, you put it in the bearing, and that's it. Why do you think they don't lubricate the motor before they put it in there, since I'm gonna put it only once? Because it'll leak through when it's traveling. It may not be right side up the entire time. That's one thing. Other thing is what? The motor is not running. Yeah, it was stuck for a long time. You don't know where you're storing it. It might be a moisture place. And again, moisture will cause bacteria to grow. And over time, the, the oil will decompose. If you look at all the equipment, it has some kind of uh, uh, vapor of oil in it. It's kind of middle over time. And that, that will allow the bacteria to grow. And eventually, it will. Your water, yeah. yeah. Water will that's why if you want to store the car for a long time, you want to drain the tank. If you store more than one year, you want to drain the tank and you want to empty the engine of oil. Yeah. There's a lot of procedure you can do to keep the car preserved. And some cars actually when you store it for a long time, you don't want the car to be in the tires. Over time, being in the same position for a long time, it will cause the tire to bulge and you will drive the car and it will be wobbly. So storage is out again is another thing you have to think about. Lubrication. This is what it looks like, inside sleeve, outside sleeve, and small little balls, and these balls are put in compartment. There are two types of ball bearing. The other type is actually, it's not ball bearing, it's a uh, roller. What is a roller bearing? Like? Bear bearing. Huh? That's your conscience. <laughs> so for uh, roller bearings, they have small little cylinders inside so why do you think we will use 
roller instead of ball. Yeah, more weight on it. More weight. You want to distribute the weight more evenly. And if you look here, the contact between the two metals is very, very small, the needle size. So if you want, if you have more load, probably you need more surface area so you can use roller. Sleeve bearing. Uh, we talked about that last class, and we said sleeve, bear, uh, sleeve bearing is what basically one cylinder on top of the other. More surface area, less parts moving, and less, uh, what's the word? More surface area, less moving parts. Brass or bronze cylinders in which the shaft is rotated. Why brass or bronze? That one. What else? What do you notice about brass? Talking about brass and copper. Yeah, they're malleable, but that's not why we use it there. Huh? They don't rust. That's one. Yeah. What else? It is soft. It is a softer metal. If you deal with the copper because it's malleable, it's softer metal, which means that there is less friction, and sometimes it's also even coated. You compare that with steel, it's not a stuff of steel. So either brass or bronze, even a sleeve. Uh, and the sleeve sometimes can be changed. Again, using press fitting, you take a sleeve out, you put a sleeve in. Uh, when it goes bad. Exposed to higher friction, <coughs> used for heavy duty application, heavy motors and heavy pumps. Uh, oil wick, similar to a candle. Oil wick goes into a reservoir and just drips small particles over time, and you can lift the excess oil and go back again. Oil should last for a long time unless it's exposed to moisture. That's when it starts to disintegrate or it goes somewhere. If your car is losing oil, where's the oil going? Burning or leaking. Either you're leaking it or burning it. It does not evaporate. The oil in the car is uh, rated to stand up to 400 degrees temperature. So that's uh, where the oil goes. Yarn pack lubrication. This comes a lot with bushing an oil ring lubrication. Uh, what is oil ring lubrication? Lubrication? Uh, oil ring? Range? Uh, oil ring. Oil ring. Have you ring. ever seen your car engine open? That's your contact point. That's for your pistons. Yeah, so pistons, what would you see that also in compressors? Yeah. If you look at the small little, uh, actually I saw, I'll bring this. Uh, Cylinder. So you have your cylinder. We have holes on our side that so the rings will come in here and they will press against the cylinder. So as they as the oil comes up, it's very small, there is small well, here's in here where the oil comes up, but this one here is sealed, and as it comes down, it wipes all the oil. But you also have, um, through the rings, you have holes. Uh, yeah, there's some little holes between them, but the top one has nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The top one will have, have nothing, and you have small holes that the oil will go through, and it lubricates down. This is the oil wick. You fill it, and the oil has nowhere to go. You fill the oil, and eventually it will lubricate over time. Once it turns out, you will see that the reservoir is empty. Ground packed, centering, it's a different surface area. And again, uh, what about this one here? This is an oil ring that lubricates the, the bearing, but there's an oil in the bottom, oil reservoir, and every time you go in the bottom, it will drag some oil with it keep the bearing lubricated. Uh, I don't think you'll encounter any of these as an engine technician, but if you work in a power plant and you work with big compressors, like commercial compressors, or commercial, uh, commercial motors, probably you'll have to deal with these uh, a little bit. And probably they'll give you an introduction course on how to do preventive maintenance on at least. This is something probably you do all the time. You have to change the oil every some certain amount of hours. Two things I want to finish before we hit the class. Motor drive. Can somebody tell me what kind of drive do we have? Two, two kinds. Correct. 
direct and indirect banking. So that's very easy, and you will see both working with the uh, motors. This is my motor. This is my pump. Direct drive, you have a coupling, and the same RPM is uh, achieved by both uh, the appliance and the motor. In there, you have either a gear or a belt, mostly for our uh, uses here, it's a belt. Here it looks like. It's our coupling, big pump, and we have the same RPM. And this is again another kind of coupling. Uh, and we said we have plastic coupling with some motors. Uh, the coupling could be either solid, could be uh, plastic, and the plastic is used because we want to use it as safety. If something gets stuck, it should shred and uh, disengage the motor. This is a picture of indirect drive. You'll see this a lot. Uh, probably Bill has you. Did he do that live yet? Where you have to change the motor at the squirrel cage fan. And uh, this is very annoying to change, but you, it's something you will have to do at some point. So you, you see the motor is outside. And there's a build drive here between the, the inducer fan and the motor. Not actually even for residential. Yeah, you'll see this uh, on top of your uh, air handling unit. And this fan is supposed to pump air through the entire house. So, and they break a lot. The fan can break and the belt can break. And what do you think will, what will break here is the, is the bearing. And you don't change the bearing, you change the entire motor. You have to just uh, loosen. Actually, it's going to be really tight. There's no, no, there's no tension in here. You can take off the motor, loosen the belt, and you'll take the scroll cage out from here. Do we need to know about the RPM? No. Yeah, we don't. It's a really easy formula to know what is the RPM that's happening. RPM of the equipment, <coughs> the RPM of the diameter of the motor equals the RPM of the motor over the RPM of the equipment, you switch them up. If you want to know the RPM, what is the RPM of the, the inducer fan, and what is the RPM of the motor? Wouldn't it say it on it? It should say. Uh, belt tension, usually is manufacturer specified. And if not, what is the general rule? What do we used to do with the cars back in the days? Turn it off first, then you, you press on the belt. <laughs> The best, it should, it's supposed to be around like half an inch or so. But uh, too much tension, what will happen? Yeah. What else? Huh? It's gonna break the bearing. What else? Huh? It's gonna break the bearing. It's gonna break the bearing. Not, not, not right away, in a few days. We'll change the motor, change the fan. The customer will call you and say, it's not turning, it's not running again. The bearing is specified to have a uh, specific amount of tension. If you increase the tension, it will go bad. These are the terms we talked about. And that concludes our presentation for uh, more components.